This is a video of the Unit 8 test review. I'm going to go over each and every question, hopefully thoroughly enough for you all to understand it for the test. So number one says find the area of the triangle. So um, that formula is area is equal to 1 half base times height. And that formula is on the formula sheet. Um, <clears throat> so I notice I don't have either one of these. I don't have the base which would be down here, and I don't have the height, which would be over here. Now, one of the things that I notice immediately, though, about this triangle is that it has two congruent legs, which means it's an isosceles right triangle, which tells me that this has got to be a 45-90 triangle because this angle is congruent with this angle. If those two angles are congruent, then that means they got to be 90 divided by 2. So the first thing I notice is that this is a 45-45 90 triangle. Now I have one formula for a 45, 45, 90 triangle. That is H is equal to the leg times the square root of 2. And what I also know is that the legs of these are the same. So this would be my leg and this would be a leg. So we're going to solve for the leg. We have the hypotenuse and I know that this 6 is a hypotenuse because it's opposite the right angle. So we're going to put the 6 here, and we're going to solve for our L. So just plugged in the 6. Now I want to get L by itself, so I'm going to divide both sides by the square root of 2. So that means L is equal to 6 over the square root of 2. Now some of y'all may recall that normally we would rationalize that denominator because we can't have a radical in the denominator. But for this problem, we don't really have to do that. Um, <clears throat> we need to find the area of this triangle. So it's 1 half base times height. Now we know that um, this answer is going to be, sorry, make, let me make that look a little more like a 6, 6 over the square root of 2. So that means, let me go ahead and just use a different color now, that this down here is 6 over the square root of 2. And this over here is 6 over the square root of 2. So my formula says area is equal to 1 half base times height. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to take area is equal to base times height. And I'm just going to do base times height divided by 2. So that's going to be 6 over the square root of 2 times 6 over the square root of 2 because that's my base and my height. Then I'm going to divide all that by 2. So on the top up here, I, we would get 6 times 6. That's 36. Sorry, that should have been the square root of 2 there. Let me fix this. So again, this is 6 over the square root of 2 times 6 over the square root of 2 divided by 2. So that's going to be 6 times 6 on the top. That's 36. This is going to be the square root of 4 down here. And this is still going to be all over 2. So then we've got 36. Square root of 4 is 2 divided by 2. Again, all of that's going to be divided by 2. So that's going to be 36 divided by 2, which is 18. 18 divided by 2 is 9. So my answer for this problem is going to be 9 inches. And this time it's going to be squared because it's a two-dimensional object, base and height. It's not volume. It's area. So we need to watch that when we're doing these problems. If it asks me for area, I'm going to square the unit. I'm not going to cube it. Number 2 says find the area of the square. Now we know. Um, that this is a square because it has four right angles. Um, the other reason we would know that this is a square is because these two dimensions are actually the same. Notice that there's feet here and there's yards here. Well, 12 feet is how many yards? There's three yards in a foot, I mean three feet in a yard, so I could divide this by three and that would give me that this is also four yards here. Or I could multiply the four down here by three. 4 times 3 equals 12. So I could find two answers for this problem. I could do 12 times 12. That would give me 144. And that would be feet squared. Or I could do 4 times 4, which is 16. Now that answer would be yards squared. So this problem has two different answers only because it depends on the unit that I choose to use to solve this problem.
Number three says Cavalier's principle says that if the height of two rectangular prisms is 15 inches and one has the dimensions of four by four inches by six inches, whereas the other has the dimensions of three inches by eight inches, what can be said of their volumes and why? Well, the first thing I notice is that the height here um, is the same for both of them because it says the height of two rectangular prisms is 15. So if the heights are the same, then I need to see if I can compare the basis of these two things. So we have this one over here, 4 by 6. 4 times 6, that equals 24. So our base here is 24 inches squared. And then we would multiply that times 15 because that's our height, and that would give us our volume. Over here on the right, this one we have 3 inches times 8 inches. And I notice that that also is 24 inches squared. Again, to find the volume, we would multiply that 24 times 15. So what does this tell me? This tells me that the base of both shapes is the same because the bases are the, sorry, same. Let me do that again. And the heights are the same. That tells me that cross sections are the same. Thus, the volumes are the same. We're going to say congruent. All right, now let's look at number four. It says a sample of silver has a volume of 150 millimeters square or cubed and a mass of 500 grams. What is the density of the silver? So we have to remember, first of all, that D is equal to M over V, which means density is equal to mass over volume. So we're just going to populate this formula with the values that were given. So it tells us our volume here is 150. So D is equal to, the 150 goes on the bottom because that's where our V goes. Mass is 500, so we're going to put that on top. So we're going to divide the 500 by the 150. And when we do that, we get 3.33. And um, that mass was grams up here. And the volume was millimeters down here. And it's millimeters cubed. So when I actually write my answer here, I'm going to say grams per millimeter cubed. So number five says a cube has an edge length of four centimeters. What is its volume? Okay, so on this one, um, it says, first of all, that this is a cube. So really all we have to do is know that this is a three-dimensional object that has three dimensions that are all the same. So we can say that four times four times 4, which is 4 to the third, is what our answer is. So that's going to be 64. And our unit is centimeters here, so our unit of uh, measure is going to be centimeters cubed. Number 6 says, a rectangular prism with a height of 4 centimeter, or four inches in a square base of 2 by 2, um, and a cylinder has a radius of 4 inches and a height of 10 inches, what is the relationship between the two volumes of the two solids? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to find out the volume of one, and then we're going to find out the volume of the other, and we're going to compare them. So the rectangular uh, prism, keyword here prism, on this one we just do base times height. So the base, so the volume of the prism um, is the base times the height. Our base there, if you notice, is 2 by 2, so I'm going to say 2 times 2, and then our height is 4. So 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 4 is 16, so this is going to be 16 inches cubed for the volume of our prism. Then we need to find the volume of our cylinder. So the formula for the cylinder is pi r squared h. It tells us here that the radius is 4 inches, so that's going to be 4 squared. Our height is 10 inches times 10, and then we're going to multiply that by pi. So this is going to be 16 times 10, 
which is 160. So this is 160 pi. Now this time we do have to multiply by pi um, because when we do that, um, we are going to <clears throat> uh, find the final answer. And we need to do that because we, they both need to be in inches cubed um, with no pi in them. So that's going to be 502.65, again, inches cubed. So now it asks us what's the relationship between the two solids. So I notice that this one's bigger than, uh, that the um, cylinder's bigger than the prism. So I'm just going to divide that number, 502, sorry, 0.65 by 16. And when I do that, I get 31.4. So what that tells me is that the cylinder is 31.4 times bigger than the prism. Number seven says, what is the volume of cylinder with a base area of 56.25 pi centimeters squared and a height of three centimeters? So again, we have a cylinder, so let's look at our formulas there. So the, um, and what we need to remember is all of these have a formula. Um, everything but a sphere has a formula of base times height. Um, and then depending on whether it's a cone or a pyramid, if we if it's a cone or a pyramid, we're going to divide that by three. But this is a cylinder. So this is going to be base times height. Notice that it says here that we have the base area of 56.25 pi centimeters squared and then a height. So we're actually just going to take that base area, which is 56.25 pi, and we're going to multiply it times our height, three. When we do that, let me look at my cheat sheet here. <laughs> um, that's going to give us 168.75 pi, and that's centimeters cubed. Now, if the answer doesn't have pi in it, we know we've got to multiply by pi. So that's going to give us, when we multiply by pi, 530.14 centimeters cubed. Remember, this one is our exact, and this one's our approximate. Number eight says the circumference of a circle is 10 pi millimeters. What is the area of the circle? Now I notice this word circumference here. So I'm going to look at my formula sheet and see if I can find my formula for the circumference. And the one that I see is C is equal to two pi R. So then I'm going to set that circumference equal to the formula two pi R. So that's going to be 10 pi equals two pi R. Now I notice on the right, I need to get r by itself. So I'm going to divide both sides by 2 pi. And when I do that, I'm going to get that r equals, because pi's cancel out here, pi's cancel out there, 2's cancel out there. 10 divided by 2 is 5. So our radius is 5. Now we can find the area because the formula for the area of a circle is pi r squared. Prior to this, we did not have r. So that's one of the things you need to keep in mind. If it's asking us for the area, we need to have the formula for the area. We don't have R, so we've got to solve for R. So the area of the circle is going to be pi times 5 squared. That's going to be 25 pi. And this answer would be millimeters. And again, this is squared because this is area. Now, if it asks us to take this answer one step further and multiply by pi, then we have to do that and write the answer. And that answer, the approximate answer, would be 78.54, again, millimeters squared, because this is it. Okay, so number nine says, what is the volume in feet of a pyramid whose base is 12 inches by 36 inches? and its height is 12 inches. So notice here that it says it wants our um, volume in feet, but we were given the problem in inches. So there's a couple ways we could do this. First, we could convert these inches to feet. So 12 inches equals one foot, 36 inches, because we know that um, there are 12 inches in a foot, 
36 inches equals 3 feet. And over here, again, our 12 inches equal 1 foot. Okay? So when we do this, um, we can now just go ahead and solve with these parts. So we have um, our volume of a pyramid is 1 third base times height. So that's equal to 1 times 3 times 1 divided by 3. Because again, multiplying by 1 third is the same as dividing by 3. So on the top we get 3, and on the bottom we get 3, and 3 divided by 3 is actually equal to 1. So the answer to this problem in feet is 1 foot cubed. Number 10 says what solid is created when a right triangle is rotated 360 degrees around an angle. So a right triangle looks like this. And if we rotate this thing all the way around, it's going to create that shape right there. And when we rotate, so when we rotate a right triangle 360 degrees around an axis, this would be our axis, it creates a cone. Okay. So this next problem says, you have a two spheres. The radius of the second sphere is five times the length of the radius of the first sphere. The volume of the first sphere is 4,188.8. What's the volume of the second sphere? So this is one of those effect problems. It doesn't say that, but that's what it is. We see this five times here. So basically that tells us that the second sphere is five to the third times bigger. Because again, a sphere is a three-dimensional object. So we know that it's going to get 125 times bigger. So we can take the volume of the original sphere, which was 4,188.8, and we can multiply that times 125 to get the volume of our second sphere. So when we multiply our first sphere times 125, we get 523,600, and again, our unit here is centimeters cubed. And that is the answer to the volume of our second sphere. Number 12 says, what is the volume of a cone with a base of 12 pi inches squared and a height of 4 inches less than twice the radius? So, um, we got the base area of the cone here. Uh, volume is equal to, of a cone is equal to one third base times height or one third pi, sorry, r squared h. Um, it says that the height is four inches less than twice the radius here. Four inches less than twice the radius. So it sounds to me like we got to find the radius because we can't find the height unless we know the radius. So I know that the base of a cone is a circle, so I'm going to use the area of a circle formula here, which is pi r squared, um, and I'm going to say that 12 pi is equal to pi r squared. Well, I can see that the pi's cancel each other out here, and when I do that, then I'm going to take the square root of 12 on both sides. I'm going to take square root, so that means that I'm going to take square root of 12. Well, that's 3.46, and that's equal to my radius. Now, over here, it says that my height is 3 less than twice the radius. So height is 3 less than twice the radius, so twice the radius, and 3 less means minus 3, so that's going to be my height. So my height is going to be equal to 2, times 3.46, and then I'm going to subtract 3 from that. <clears throat> so that's going to be 2.92. So that's going to be my height. So once again, we're going to then take stuff back to this formula right here. We already had our base, so volume is equal to base times height. So our base was 12 pi. Our height is 2.92, so I'm going to multiply 12 times 12 pi times 2.92, and then I'm going to divide all that by 3 because, again, this shape is a cone, so we can't forget that. So when I do that, I get 11.68 uh, pi, and our unit here, again, was inches, 
So this is going to be inches cubed. And if it asks me to put the answer as an approximate answer, or those are my answer choices, then I'm going to multiply by pi. So that's going to give me 36.69, again, inches cubed. Number 13 says, what is the area of the parallelogram? Well, again, area is equal to base times height. So um, our base here, if you notice up here, we got this up here. So that means this down here would also be 25. So our base is 25. But the thing that we're lacking in this problem is the height. We don't have this measure right here. So what we're going to have to do is find that measure. Well, I just happen to know that the height is a right angle there. So I'm going to find the height using Pythagorean's theorem. So I'm going to use a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And this is my height here. So let's go ahead and plug these values in. Now I happen to know that that's c because it's opposite the right angle. So I'm going to put my 10 squared over here. And then I can make um, this 6 feet either a or b. doesn't really matter, but I'm going to go ahead and make it a. So that's 6 squared plus h squared. So that's going to be 36 plus h squared equals 100. When I subtract 36 from 100, I get h squared equals 64. Then I'm going to take the square root of both sides. So that's h is equal to 8. So now we know our height. So our formula is base times height. So area is equal to base, which is 25, times the height, which is 8. Um, and when we multiply 25 times 8, we get 200. And again, our unit here is feet, and this is area, so it's going to be feet squared. That's going to be our answer. 14 says, what is the height of a rectangular prism with a length of 6 feet, a width of 10 feet, and a volume of 540 feet cubed? So this time we're looking for the height of a prism. Well, our volume of a prism is base times height, and it says we have a length and a width of 10. So that's our base. So we're going to say our volume over here is 540. So we're say 540 is equal to our base, which is 6 times 10 times our height. So we've got 540 is equal to 60 times h. So we're going to divide both sides by 60 now. And when we divide both sides by 60, 540 divided by 60 is 9. So our height is equal to 9. And it's 9 feet because that was our unit. So number 15 says, name the 2D shape created in the given 3D figures cross section. So I noticed with this first one here that we have a square pyramid. And... Um, if I look at the square pyramid and I look at the shape right here, I can tell that that's the square we're talking about. So this one's a square. Here, we're taking straight down through the middle through the apex. So I see the shape here is going to be a triangle. Here again, we're going right down through the middle. So I see that this shape right here is a rectangle. And this one, again, we're going straight down through the shape. And so, again, I see here that we're going to have a square. So this one's a square as well. Number 16 says, what's the volume of the sphere? Well, our formula for the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And I have r right here. It's the radius. So I'm going to say 4 thirds pi. And I'm going to cube the radius. So that's 9 to the third. So typically when I do this in the calculator, I do it like this. 4 times 9 to the third divided by 3. And then I add pi on at the end. That's the way I typically do it in the calculator. So when I do 4 times 9 to the third, and um, I divide that by 3, that would be 2196 divided by 3, and that's got pi on it. So that gives me the volume of 972 pi centimeters cubed. 
Now, if I go ahead and multiply that by pi, I'm going to get 3,053.63, again, centimeters cubed. And part B says, what is the volume of the hemisphere? So if I'm trying to find the volume of the hemisphere, all I have to do is take the volume for the sphere and divide it by 2. So I'm just going to do 972 pi, divide that by 2. And when I do, I get 486 pi centimeters cubed. And I'm also going to go over here and do it with the other number, 3053.63, divide that by 2. When I do that, I get 1,526.81. And again, this is centimeters cubed. 17 says find the volume of the composite figure and round to the nearest tenth. Well, a composite figure basically means that we have two different shapes here, and we're going to add them together. So I notice down here, well, actually, let's just talk about the top. So I notice up here that I have a cone. And I notice down here that the diameter of that cone is 3 which means that the radius, if I have a diameter of 3, then the radius is equal to the diameter divided by 2. So that means our radius is going to be 1.5. So if I'm trying to find um, the volume of that cone up there, the volume of the cone is going to be 1 third pi r squared h. So that's going to be 1 third times pi that's going to be 1.5 squared times our height, which is 3. So when I do this, um, I'm going to get the volume for the cone of 2.25 pi. Then I have to find the volume of the cylinder. We know that um, is pi r squared h. So again, we know our r is 1.5, so we're going to do pi 1.5 squared, and the height this time out here is 8.1, so I'm going to multiply that times 8.1. So the volume of our cylinder is going to be 18.225 pi. Then I need to add these two together to get the volume of the whole thing. So I'm going to add 2.25 pi plus 18.225 pi. When I do that, I get 20.475 pi, and this is feet cubed. Now, if I need the approximate answer, then I multiply by pi. That would give me 64.32, again, feet cubed. The rest of the questions on the review on the um, review for the test are questions from previous tests, um, and there are going to be questions on this test that map back to old tests. So let's look at this question right here. Um, we can see here that we have two triangles. We have a little triangle right here, and we have a big triangle right here. So we need to map some sides to each other here. So I just happen to notice that I have GH here and I have BC here. So I could say GH over BC, and then it says here that we're looking for GB. So I'm actually looking for this length right here, but I'm also looking for AB, which is the whole length. So that means I could take whole over part again. So I could take um, GH, this is part of the little small triangle, so that would be AG here. So let me show you here. So if I talk about little triangles, so I've got this, and I'm going to put it over that. I'm going to, I'm going to map those together. So I got AG. So GH maps to AG. And if I notice again, this is BC, that's the bottom, and that has to do with the whole big triangle. So we need the whole big triangle here, which is AB. So now let's put some numbers in this. So when we put some numbers in this, GH is 10, whoops, and um, BC was 25, then we've got AG, which was 16, and we don't have a, 
um, yeah, AB. So we're going to leave AB down here. So the way we do this problem is we cross multiply. So that means we're going to multiply here. So that's 10 AB. And that's equal to the multiplication of these two together. So that's 25 times 16. So when I do this problem, 10 AB is going to be equal to 400. This thing doesn't want to cooperate with that pen, so we're going to swap pens here. 10 AB equals 400. I'm going to divide both sides by 10 here. So AB is equal to 40. So that means this whole length over here is 40. So that then that means that I should be able to find GB because I know what AG is. So to find GB, I can just say AB minus AG equals GB. So that's going to be 40 minus 16, and that's 24. So AB was 40, and GB was 24. So number 19 says a string that is 100 feet long is attached to a vertical pole that is 20 feet high and is approximately 98 feet away from the pole on the ground. What is the angle the string makes with the ground to the nearest degree? So I'm going to go ahead and draw this because it's just going to be easier for me. So it says I have a vertical pole and then I have a string. So the vertical pole is 20 feet. I have a string that's attached to it um, and this is 100 feet. Um, and it says that it's approximately 98 feet away from the pole. So this is going to be a right angle here because poles are always vertical to the ground. Um, so it's asking me, um, what is the angle the string makes with the ground? So that is this angle right here. Now to find this, we are going to have to use a ratio and an inverse ratio. Um, because that's how we find angles. So I want you guys to look at, um, we've got this side right here, which is the opposite. And then we've got the hypotenuse here, and this is the adjacent. So this would be the adjacent side. This would be the opposite side, and this would be the hypotenuse. So truth be told, we could use any ratio we want here. So let's just look at sine. Let's do the inverse sine. So the inverse sine would be opposite over hypotenuse. That's what it says on your formula sheet. So that's 20 over 100. And when I put in my calculator, the inverse sign, which means second sign, and remember, make sure your calculator's in degree mode. Um, so if I do second sign of 20 over 100, that tells me that it's 11.54, and it tells me to give it to the nearest degree. So that's going to be 12 degrees. Now I just want you guys to see that there's more than one way to solve this. So I could also use cosine. And in my uh, on my formula sheet again cosine means adjacent over hypotenuse so if i do the inverse cosine of 198 over 100 that's adjacent over hypotenuse that also gives me 11.54 which again we can take to 12 degrees because it says to the nearest degree and then we could also use our tangent ratio tangent means opposite over adjacent that would be 20 over 98 Again, when I do that, I get 11.54. So you can use whichever ratio you like the most on this problem. But be careful when you're doing problems like this to make sure that you have the measures for the parts of the ratio that you need. Number 20 says, what is the sine of A to the nearest hundredth? So first of all, I'm going to look at my formula sheet and see what sine means. And on a formula sheet, it says sine means opposite over hypotenuse. So, and we're talking about angle A, so that's the angle up here. So I know that this is opposite down here, and this is my hypotenuse. I know that's hypotenuse because it's opposite the right angle, and I know this is opposite because it's opposite A. So if I do this, then we're talking about opposite over hypotenuse. So we're going to take the numbers that are right there in our equation, 15 over 18. And when I do that, I can reduce this, so if it was given to me in a fraction form, I know that both of those are divisible by 3. So um, 3 into 15 is 5, and 3 into 18 is 6. 
but I might also get this answer in decimals. So I'm going to divide 15 by 18, and when I do that, it gives it to me in a decimal form. So depending on how the answer is represented for you, it might be a fraction or it might be a decimal. Number 20 sa 21 says, what is the value of y? So the first thing I notice about this shape is that it's a quadrilateral and that its opposite sides are congruent. That tells me uh, that this is a parallelogram. And I know that if this is a parallelogram, and actually I know if it's a quadrilateral, that opposite, um, the consecutive angles are supplementary. Now, because it's a parallelogram, I know that opposite angles are congruent. So when I'm looking at this problem, I need to look and see what can I use of that information. The next thing I notice is that this has an X and this has an X. So if those two have an X and they're right next to each other, that means they're consecutive angles. So that means they're supplementary. When I add these two angles together, they equal 180. So that's how I'm going to set this problem up. I'm going to do 2x plus 50 plus 3x minus 20. That equals 180. Again, because those angles are right next to each other, we know that they're supplementary. 2x plus 3x are like terms, so that's 5x. 50 minus 20 is 30, so I'm going to say plus 30. And that equals 180. Then I'm going to subtract this 30 from both sides. So that gives me 5x equals 150, and then I'm going to divide both sides by 5, so my x is equal to 30. Now the problem actually asks me to solve for y, so i got to figure out how I can solve for y. Now there's actually two different ways I could solve for y. Again, these are um, over here on the right. These two angles right here are consecutive angles, so I could add them together and set them equal to 180 after I solve for this angle up here. Or I also know that opposite angles are congruent. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm actually going to solve for this angle up here, and I'm going to set them equal to each other. So my x was 30, so I'm going to say 2 times 30 plus 50. So, um, and again, we're solving for this angle right here. So that's 60 plus 50, so that's 110. So we know that this angle is 110 degrees. Now we know that these two angles are congruent. So we can say that 110 is equal to 4y plus 10. So when I go to solve this, sorry, that's supposed to be a y, y'all. I'm going to subtract 10 from both sides. So that's 100 equals 4y. And 4 into, uh, well, I'm going to divide both sides by 4. So y is equal to 25. And this is the answer we're looking for.